السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نحمد الله ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters, welcome back to our seventh episode of our series The Saviors of Islam where we have been speaking about the great personalities of the past that have ruled the world and the hearts of the people of the world Today, we will be speaking about an individual a personality that had changed the landscape of the world through his mind, through his compassion, through his love and most of all through his sincerity for his religion. He was a man that every single child in the world has love for. Every single father when his child is born, every single mother when her son is born, they think of his name and they aspire that their child will one day become like this great man. He was a man that till today, 800 years after his demise and his death, when we say his name, Muslims or non-Muslims, when we think of him, love seeps into our heart for him. He was not only a general of an army, but rather he was a scholar. He was a compassionate individual. He was a loving man. And through these traits, he ruled not only the physical landscapes of the world, but ruled the hearts of the people that lived within this world. When we think of great men, when we think of great emperors, and great commanders, our books of our history, the pages of our history, turn to the likes and the personalities of Alexander the Great, of the Macedonian Empire. They turn to the personalities of Napoleon, of the French Empire. The, the pages of our history open to the names of Cyrus, of the Roman Empire. They open to the names of Richard the Lionheart, of the British Empire. They opened the names of Genghis Khan of the Mongolian Empire. But let the world know and let's rewrite the books of our history within this Western world that there is no commander, there is no emperor, there is no leader or general of an army who can ever come close to the greatest emperor of the world. To the greatest general that recent history has ever seen. Let the world rewrite his name in ink that can never be erased. And let our children know who this man was, who was none other than the great Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahimahullah ta'ala. Da'il ayyama taf'alu ma tasha'a wa tib nafsan idha hakam al-qadha wa la tajza li hadithatil layali فما لحوادث الدنيا بقى. Who was this great Salahuddin? Salahuddin Ayyubi rahimahullah was born in a small city called Tikrit in the province of Iraq. The mother of Salahuddin says that when I was when Salahuddin was in my womb, I saw a dream that I was pulling a sword from the sword of Allah out of my womb. And later on, he became the great Salahuddin Ayyubi rahimahullah taala. And the as a child, he his greatest ambition and objective of life was to become a scholar, was to become a student of knowledge and to become a scholar. So hence his father sent him to al Nuruddin al Zinki who was in Syria and Sham, who was the greatest scholar, the general of Sham, who had many disciples beneath him and under him. Salah al-Din goes to him and for many years he benefits from his knowledge, benefits from his discipline that he, that he taught Salah al-Din. And then a time came that Adid from Misr sent a letter to Nuruddin saying that, Oh Nuruddin, the crusaders have, they have covered and enclosed all of the gates of Misr and they are about to take our, our, our city over and they will kill each and every one of us. And he cuts the hair of his wife and sends it to him with this letter, a sign that we cannot protect anyone, we cannot protect our women anymore. So Nuruddin Zinki rahimullah, sees this letter and decides to send reinforcements and help for Adid in Misr. So he sends the uncle of Salahuddin al-Shirku in Salahuddin Ayyubi rahimullah. As a youngster, Nuruddin saw the greatness coming from him. He had the firasa and the farsightedness to see that this child will one day become a great emperor and a general. He sends Shirku and Ibn Shaddad says, when I asked Salahuddin, he would tell me that I don't really want to go. And the first reason why I don't want to go is because I want to become a scholar. I don't want to become an a, a emperor or the general of an army. And number two, I'm young and I'm scared of death. 
But Ibn Shaddad says, the second we reached the gates of Misr, in the second Allah gave us victory, he looked at me with a dead stare in his eyes and he said, this from today on is the motive of my life to help unite and protect the sanctity of the lives of the Muslims. So even though he was not prepared for it, Allah put it within his heart. And then Sharku passes away his uncle and Adid passes away. And the people of Egypt get together and they pledge allegiance in the hands of Salahuddin. The emperors, the ministers, the kings, the scholars all agree that this is the man that we want to lead us. Not because of his power, not because of the tech tactical mind that he had, but because the love and compassion that he showed for Muslims. And then he goes on this journey of uniting the Muslims. For 14 years, from 14 to 13 years, he continues his battle. Ibn Shaddad says, for majority of his life, he worked tirelessly to unite the Muslims together. And he starts his journey of uniting the people of Misr, then uniting the people of Sham, then uniting the people of, of Beirut, then uniting the people of Yemen, then uniting the people of all these countries and putting them together and bringing them under the one banner of Islam. Because at that time, Muslims were broken into different variations and different groups and sects and different dynasties. You can imagine the people of Sham at that time when Nur al-Din had locked up the wretched man known as Reginald of Shantanal. For 15 years he was imprisoned in the, in the dungeons of Halab. And when he passes away, Nur al-Din passes away, the people of Halab, they, they let him go. They let him walk. We can see the difference within the mindsets of the Muslims at that time. They let him walk. The second they let him walk, the Reginald prepares an army and he makes a vow and he says, I will take this army, I will take this army to the Kaaba in Mecca and I will destroy the Kaaba to pebbles and ashes and then I will go to Medina and I will take the body of Na'ud Billah, the camel herder and the shepherd and I will bring him back to my city and to my palace, Na'ud Billah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I will make the Muslims pay to see his body. When Salahuddin heard this, he looked into the sky and he made an announcement to Allah. So Allah, you make me the source and the means of stopping this man. And make me a means of this wretched person being halted in his intentions. And once again, there's such a wretched man. Once again, once the Muslims are traveling from Hajj, and he stops all of them. And more than 7,000 Muslims are in this caravan. He stops them, pulls them out, and he asks them, ask your Muhammad to save you now. Ask your Muhammad to save you now. And one by one butchers the heads of these Muslims. We speak about mercilessly killing and butchering. This is what this man was a symbol of. The crusaders symbolize that all throughout the lands of the Muslims. One by one butchering the Muslims in every single area until Salahuddin came and started uniting the Muslim on one front. And then when he unites all of these Muslims at the age of 32 years old, he has different Muslim lands within his control and he gets together and now he ventures out towards the greatest goal of his life the freedom of Bayt al-Maqdis. And he moves towards Bayt al-Maqdis and then takes place the greatest battle of that time, the battle of Hittin. The battle of Hittin where the crusaders had all gotten together to stop this force and this wrecking, this wrecking force of a man of Salahuddin. They get together and the forces and the odds were against him. And the Shaddad says that we see this man in the middle of the night, crying to Allah, weeping excessively. We wake up from his weeping and sobbing. And you see the tears coming down his cheeks to his beard. And his beard being full of tears to such an extent that it falls to his clothes in his lap. And those tears collecting themselves so much that they are dripping upon the floor. This was a reminder of the scene that took place when the Prophet was crying in the battle of Badr. On the night before Badr, in the 17th night of Ramadan, where the Prophet was crying and weeping and beseeching the mercy of Allah. Ibn Shaddad said, this reminded us of that night. 
with Salahuddin was continuously weeping in the eyes of in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where victory came from. Victory came not from power. Victory came not from intelligence. Victory came in trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the next day Allah granted them victory. And then the Shaddad says that this was the greatest victory that the Muslims had ever tasted ever since Khalid and the Walid defeated the Romans in the Battle of Yarmouk. And then Salahuddin continues his journey to venture along the greatest goal of his mind, to free the lands of the Muslims, to free the land of the third most sacred place in the eyes of Muslims. He reaches the gates of Bayt al and for five days he circles them, planning and thinking of a way to take over these lands and these forts. And on the sixth day, he strikes these la this land and he enters a city. And ho, he enters a city on the same day, coincidentally, where the Prophet Wasallam entered Bayt al for the first time on his beautiful journey towards meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the 27th night of Rajab, he enters Bayt al many brothers and sisters. I would want all of us to think for a moment the amount of fulfillment, the amount of joy, the amount of contentment that was seeping inside of the heart of Salahuddin and the people with him. That they entered this land and do you not think they were reminded that when they see the walls of Quds they're reminded about the heads of the children of the Muslims that were butchered against these walls. When they see these lands, do you not think they were reminded about the women of the Muslims who were mercilessly slaughtered and killed without any crime, but the crime of being Muslims? Do you not think when they entered these lands, Stanley Pope says that a great Christian historian, that when the Crusaders took over these lands, 88 years before Salahuddin, came back and freed the Muslims. When they took over these lands, they took the children in the laps of the mothers by their feet and flung them against the walls. They killed the mothers and the wives in front of their husbands and their fathers. And they told the Muslims, whoever enters inside of this masjid, they are free. And they are protected. And their blood will not be dropped. And they will not be killed. But as soon as they entered into the walls of Bayt al-Maqdis and of the Masjid of Quds, they turn their backs against them and their vows against them. How treacherous and how deceiving and how conniving were these wretched men that they took their swords and they slaughtered more than 70,000 Muslims. And not only did they slaughter them, they boasted and they were proud and they would say that the blood of the Muslims has reached our knees. And they would say, they would say, let us wash, let us wash the sacred places of the Muslims with their blood. Let's watch, wash those sacred places with the blood of the Muslims. And when Salahuddin came, he said, let's wash the sacred churches of the Christians with the rose water. The difference in the mindsets, the difference in the objective, the objective was not to take the lives of innocent people. The objective was to bring peace to the Muslims and to the non-Muslims alike. What Stanley Lane Pope says, that it was this young Kurdi man who taught the greatest emperors of England and France and Germany and Austria, the emperors like Richard and Philip, how to be compassionate when in power, how to show mercy when in power. This entrance into Quds is a historic scene. How I wish we could rewind the days and the nights in the years where more than 800 years ago he entered this beautiful city. After this, these atrocities that spilled the blood of Muslims. It was, it was like the Prophet entering Mecca after eight years of being kicked out and living in Medina with all the Sahabas of Fatih Mecca. It was like when the Prophet was entering Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were remembering the area where Bilal was tortured. They were being reminded of the areas where Sumayya and Yasir were killed. They were being reminded of the areas where Khabab and Khubayb were tortured. They were being reminded of these areas where the Muslims were boycotted. After eight years they enter into the city of Mecca 
and they are chanting, Al Yawm Yawm Al Malhamah. Today is a day of butchery. Today is a day of revenge. And the merciful, the most merciful man the world has ever seen, the Prophet Sallallahu says to them, Today is the day, not of revenge, today is the day of where we show compassion and mercy. Today is the day we showed the world that Islam is a religion of love. Islam is a religion of compassion. In Salahuddin, embodied and symbolized this, this same act. When he entered the city, he did not once again impersonate and reenact what the Crusaders did 88 years ago by killing all the Muslims in that land, only leaving less than 5,000 Muslims living there. Or rather, he came inside and he told the king of Jerusalem, he told the king, the, the, the man that was in charge at that time before Salahuddin came, he told the Balion that, hey, whoever you want to leave with you, whoever wants to leave can leave. We will not touch you. You have to pay a certain amount of wage to leave. You pay it and you leave without anyone touching you. And your churches will remain churches. And the synagogues will remain synagogues. And the masjid will become masjid once again. And the adhan will be akur from the masjid once again. And the floor will taste the sweetness of sajda once again. This will happen again. As it happened at that time, it will happen once again in the future by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he frees everyone. And he tells the people, he tells Balian, whoever cannot afford it, I will pay for them. I will pay for them. So he earns this victory, this high point in his life. Now he feels like everything is finished, but little did he know that the king of Germany, Richard of England, Philip of France, and of Austria, they get together and they build an army of more than 600,000 people, the Third Crusade, and they come, to, they come once again to Beit al-Maqdis to try to defeat Salahuddin and to try to remove his forces. For five years he stands tall and he protects the Muslims. He protects the Muslims and he shows love and compassion. Richard, the Lionheart of England, a statue of him is erected outside the parliament. We don't need a statue of Salahuddin to be erected anywhere. We need a statue of Salahuddin erected within our hearts out of the love that he had for the Muslims. We need to have that love for each other. We need to know how to unite ourselves like he once did. And we need to see this within our lives today. For five years, he continues to stand this force. And finally, they, bring a, they, bring, they get to a truce and a treaty where Salahuddin and the Muslims continue to rule this land of Beit al-Maqdis without spilling the blood of Muslims or non-Muslims, but rather showing love to each other. Richard says to the brother of Salahuddin, Adil, that never in my life, I had not, he never met Salahuddin, but he said, never in my life, have a year to meet someone that I have never met as much as I want to meet your brother Salahuddin because of the love and compassion that he showed to us Christians. When Salahuddin took over Palestine in Beit al-Maqdis, Pope Urban died out of shock. Out of shock he died. That perhaps he will kill all the Christians. But he showed the world love and compassion. And he goes back to his city of Damascus, And he becomes sick. And he falls into a fever and a flu. And Ja'far says, for seven days he was sick. And for the last three days I was continuously reciting the Qur'an. And I read this Qur'an upon him. When I reached the ayah of alayhi tawakkaltu wa ilayhi unib. That there's only one Allah and upon him we put our trust in. Upon him we put our trust in. Upon him we put our trust in. Not upon the people of the world. Wa ilayhi unib. And towards him we will turn. He raises his hands and he said, Sahih. And he read the shahada and he left the world. And Ibn Shaddad says, when the world found out about his death, people mourned, people mourned like they mourned over the death of prophets in the Khulafa al Rashidin. The world had not seen such a dark day ever since the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anhu. People felt unconscious from his death. He says that people would say that I want to die in his spot. People say this I wish I died in his spot or her spot. But on that day, we felt people crying that, Oh Allah. Why did you not take us in his spot? At the age of 55 years old, he left the world. My dear brothers and sisters, it was not his power, it was not his intelligence that changed the landscape of the Muslims. But rather, it was something deeper than that. And it was the love that he had for Allah, and it was the love that he had for the creation of Allah. Muslims and non-Muslims alike, he showed compassion to all. Once Ibn Shaddad asked him, what is it within you? that because of which you have done all of that which you have completed? Is that your power or intelligence? He says, no. 
the two things that I hold very dearly towards me is number one, I have never missed salah in jama'ah in my entire life. And number two, I have never missed the night prayer all throughout my life, even though more than half of his battle was in conquest and battle. He never missed the night prayer. My dear brothers and sisters, if we want to see change in this world today, if we want to see the suffering of the Muslims end today, if we want to see that the, the Razan al Najjars of the world be protected, that where they had no crime to be killed except for the fact that they were living within those lands. And we see those videos and, and our eyes swell up and our heart mourns and grieves because these innocent children are being so easily slaughtered. A nurse being shot, Muslims being killed with no crime in Rohingya, the Burmese, in the Rohingya and the Burmese Muslims, the people of China, the people of Sham, the people of Kashmir, the people of Palestine, the people of, of Somalia, the people of the different African countries of the world. What do we have to do? Today, we do not need the power of Salahuddin. We do not need the intelligence of Salahuddin. Today, my dear brothers and sisters, we need the love and the conviction that Salahuddin had for Allah within our hearts. We need the tears of Salahuddin. We need the sincerity of Salahuddin. We need the prayer of Salahuddin. And today we will also see that same change. Allah is not in need of individuals. He did not need Salahuddin. Allah does not need anyone. Allah can do it himself. And that same Allah that was there 800 years ago that helped the Muslims at that time, the same Allah is here today. But those tears have to start weeping once again. And these nights and these days, as we cry for ourselves and our families, we also cry for the Muslims that are suffering across the world. And we actually mourn and weep for them. Like our own brothers and sisters are dying. And wallahi we will see the effect and change, the, the ripple effect of this across the world through the sincerity and love that we have for those people. It is not just a post on Facebook that will make a difference or a tweet on Twitter or a picture on Instagram. It is dua and tears that made a difference then in Badr. It was duas and tears that made a difference then in Yarmouk. It was duas and tears that made a difference then in the battle of Hittin. And it is duas and tears today that will make a difference for the Muslims that are suffering all across the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let us understand the greatness of this man and be able to derive the great qualities that made him great. The love and compassion and the sincerity that he had within his hearts. And let us be able to have a, a small portion of that within our hearts. And let, let us be proud of who we are. And let us be proud of our history. We don't shy away from our history. Or rather we see the oppression that we took as Muslims in our history. But Allah, Allah always gives. At the end of the day, Allah gives victory to the muttaqin, the believers. فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ أَمْرِهِمْ We see the ending of the oppressors. وَالْعَاقِبَةُ للمتقين. And we see the ending of the believers and we will always be smiling at the end of the day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us with these great men on the day of judgment. And let us the love that we have for them in our hearts today make this a means of our salvation in the hereafter. Jazakallah khair wa akhwa da'wan. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.